Hello and welcome to Witness. I'm Raghi Omar. Russia has waged a brutal war against Chechen separatists since the 1990s. The violence began when a former Soviet Air Force officer seized power and declared independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia, though, was not prepared to give up her oil-rich prize without a fight. But what started as a nationalist independence movement soon became a rallying cry for Islamist militants around the world who wanted to establish an Islamic state in the North Caucasus. The separatists defeated the Russian army, but four years later, the Russians came back with a vengeance. At the same time, some former rebels, like the Republic's current president, Ramzan Kadyrov, changed sides in opposition to a more militant Islam that the war had provoked among some of the separatists. Russia now claims to have finally defeated the rebels, but as we'll see from the inside in the film Chechen Fighters, resistance continues, and many who have survived the battles and fled their homeland still live in fear of their lives. This is my homeland, Chechnya. Most of the world has forgotten, but a war is still being fought there. I live in the UK now, but I used to be a fighter in the Chechen resistance against Russia. I can't tell you my name. I can't show you my face or my wounds. I can't even let you hear my voice, because I still have relatives in Chechnya, and I'm afraid of what the Russians might do to them if I reveal my identity. Spring is starting now in Britain, as it is in Chechnya. It reminds me of my country, the area where I grew up. Chechnya was a beautiful country, with so many hopes for the future. But they were destroyed, smashed. Images like these have been shot by Chechen fighters, people I know or knew. It's their way of getting around the Russian restriction on reporting from Chechnya and letting the world know that the war isn't over yet. We have fought against the Russian occupation for centuries. We even had our own Holocaust. Stalin deported the entire population east during the Second World War. A third of all Chechens died in the process. My parents were born in Kazakhstan, and so many of the population died during that deportation. They were forced out of their homes without even proper clothing. And 50 years later, it happened again. It's been happening all the time since we started to live with the Russians. So when the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, Chechnya was quick to declare its independence. And when Russia invaded three years later, I was one of the first to join Chechen army. It was my duty, to be honest, and I can't imagine my destiny without having been a part of that. When I was growing up as a boy of 10, 15, the heroes in books I was trying to make my role models were all fighters against the Russian invasion. But the amazing thing is that after two years we won that war. We beat the biggest army in Europe. For three years we had a kind of independence. And then Russia invaded again. This time bigger, harder. I was wounded at the beginning of the Second War in an ambush. We were driving and suddenly people started shooting. I tried to escape the car I was in and start shooting back. I was hit straight away. My head, legs, body. We were just going to check the way to see if it was safe for others to travel. It wasn't. Up to 200,000 people have been killed in the two wars. That's a fifth of our population. Russia now controls most of Chechnya and Mr. Putin has declared mission accomplished. But he still keeps 50,000 troops in this small country because the resistance fights on from its mountain strongholds. I'm on my way to meet another fighter. Because the Chechen community here is so small, he would be easy to identify, so I shall call him Chengiz. Like me, he has to hide his face and his voice. I met Cengiz during the first war. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. I was studying in Russia before the first war broke out. 
and when the war started I left my studies and returned home. I always had good knowledge of our history from my father's stories, how our men would take up arms to defend the country against Russians. I was wounded at the beginning of the second war and was taken out of Chechnya. I be getting news from the Chechen resistance through tapes and messages. Chengiz fought with one group in the resistance. I fought in another. These are messages sent to me. This awesome, this and this and the last ten and she had a shed. Well, I shed a shed. No, that's a hell of a shed. <laughs> How life changes people. Is Rudin, the guy on the left. He was so young, such a naughty boy. I always used to tell him off for speeding around in his car, for arguing, just behaving like a kid. And here he's a grown man, talking like a grown man ready to die for something. What amazing destinies people have. I sent them ten watches in the end, just before his Rudin was killed. He was captured. They put out his eyes, cut his nose and ears, broke every bone in his body. They wanted him to betray the resistance. When his village got his corpse, people said it was the most mutilated body they've seen from both wars. After I was wounded, my brothers, I had five of them, started to join the rebels. One was killed without even participating in anything. He was taken away from his home. And we never heard about him again. That caused my other brothers, one after another, to join the resistance and they were killed after that. When the third one died, I took away from that town the two youngest brothers just because I knew their attitude to what's going on would be the same, if not stronger. One of them decided to go back, and I couldn't stop him. He went back to Chechnya and he died. With my youngest brother, I managed to get him married. He was in love with a beautiful lady. And as soon as I found out, I decided that would be the way to keep him away from the war. I collected some money, and my friends helped me, and we arranged a kind of wedding ceremony. And now he lives with his wife and kid. He's got a son who was named after his older brother. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Like my four dead brothers, young people go to the mountains and join the resistance whenever the commanders need them. That's Aslan Mashadov. Chengi served under him. He was elected president of Chechnya in 1997. Mashadov said to continue this war, to be effective against Russia, all he needed was 1,500, 2,000 people. No more. The more you've got, the more visible you become. The people in Balaklavas are hiding their faces because they have to go to towns to see their relatives, to bring back information. Maskara was our most moderate leader, the one the Russians could negotiate with, but they didn't want to negotiate and killed him in 2005. Many of them died. I have so many memories of these people, who they were before the war and how they ended up. That's Muhammad Amin. He was a farmer. Twelve members of his family have been killed. And that's Ahmad Avdorhanov. He was my commander. <laughs> <laughs> Ahmad was just a farmer too. Just a normal civilian. He wasn't a professional soldier. But he became a brigadier general. Ranks and positions don't play a great role in the resistance. Here you see a leader preparing food for his soldiers. Ahmad was an ordinary man who would never offend anyone. <laughs> he always tried to be a friendly. Everybody loved him. Even those who fought him didn't say anything insulting about him. 
He was truly a heroic man respected by his enemies. Before the war, for most people, religion was only important during weddings and funerals. But the Russians forced us into a corner, and now the fighters have turned to Islam as something to keep them going. We are not extremists, but we all pray now. <laughs> 